Hello and welcome to video 16. This is on the end of the apology or the end of the defense. Um, and in this part of the dialogue, Socrates makes a lot of really big, really weird, and often very famous claims. And I'm just going to scratch the surface of what, the, what, what, what is going on in this part of the dialogue. Um, so yeah, let's just get to it. So um, I've been showing you this outline. We started with Socrates speaking plainly, uh, addressing his current accusers and the original accusers. Uh, he has his origin story of uh, the mission from Delphi and the dialogue with Miletus, where he finally begins to um, respond to the direct charges against him. But mostly what you see in all of this is not the reply to the charges against him, um, but a picture of who Socrates is, what he is doing, what he is looking for, what he thinks the city needs. So now, in this last part of the dialogue, um, Socrates just gets to really challenging the, uh, the jury. He's no longer interested in um, argument or explanation. He's just extremely defiant. And he starts by saying that he's not afraid to die, uh, but he also says that he will not obey the jury. Um, and he says this because um, he doesn't believe that he can be harmed by the jury or by anyone. And this is also the section where we get the metaphor of the gadfly. Um, Socrates uh, says, uh, talks about how his past noble his past noble actions. He says he won't beg, um, and then he gives this one of the most famous lines from this dialogue: "The unexamined life is not for a human being." And then finally, he says again, "Death is not a harm." So let's just run through some of this. I love and cherish you, men of Athens, but I am more obedient to the God than to you. And so as long as I have breath and I am able, I will not cease seeking wisdom. And then later, it's impossible for me to keep quiet because that means disobeying the God. So... One of the things that Socrates has said is that his life activity of doing philosophy, of questioning people in public, is divinely ordained. So uh, the jury might have been inclined to give him a penalty less than death, um, like exile, for instance, or a fine. Um, but he, write, he rules that out right here. He says... If you want to stop me from doing what I'm doing, you're going to have to kill me. So combined with the earlier efforts that don't seem to be all about placating the jury, he really doesn't seem to be interested in, in, in being found innocent here. So here's another defiant thing that Socrates says in this context. Neither Miletus nor Anetus can do me any harm at all. They would not have the power, because I do not believe that the law of God permits a better man to be harmed by a worse. So if this was a live class, I would have you discuss this. What does this mean? Um, but uh, I'm just going to right now jump to uh, putting an argument in canonical form here. So what part of the deal here is that Socrates has made it clear that um, he's not afraid of death. And what he says is, death, either there is life after death, or death is a big sleep. Well, the sleeping are not harmed. And if there's life after death, that is not a harm. Therefore, this is our intermediate conclusion, death is not a harm. That's a really intense idea. I mean, and you know, when, when someone's just saying, oh, I'm not afraid to die, that sounds might just sound like bravado. 
Um, but if you really try and think through this idea that death is not a harm, well, it begins to radically reshape pretty much your attitude towards everything. Um, he also says that harm is becoming unjust. This is another crucial Platonic and Socratic theme. Um, everyone wants what is good. Goodness is, uh, all virtues amount to knowing what is good. And harm really is being separated from being good. Harm is being unjust. So you don't harm someone by punching them in the face. You harm someone by corrupting their soul. And all of this says that the better man cannot be harmed by the worse. As long as you're the better man, the worse person has not corrupted your soul. They can kick you in the teeth all they want. You're still unharmed by them because you are the better person. Now, do we really believe that? Can death really not be a, a harm for Socrates? Well, let's, let's just look at more of these quotes. No doubt my accuser might put me to death or have me banished or deprived of civic rights. But even if he thinks, and he, as he probably does, as others do, I dare say, that these are great calamities, I do not think so. For I believe it is far worse to be doing what he is doing now, trying to put a man to death unjustly. That is to say, Socrates would rather be put to death unjustly then be the kind of person who puts someone else to death unjustly. It is better to be the victim of injustice than the perpetrator of injustice, because clearly the perpetrator of injustice has the one thing that you don't want, a corrupt soul. The difficulty is not so much to escape death, the real difficulty is to escape from wickedness, which is far more fleet of foot. I'm not trying to stay alive. I'm trying to do the right thing. And so when Anetus and Miletus put Socrates to death, they are hurting themselves more than they are hurting him because they are being unjust. And again, this sounds good. This sounds really big. Um, Plato is a philosopher who makes big, outrageous, hard to, hard to really digest claims. And you might want to embrace it, but when you really start to think about what it would mean to live this way, it's a radical transformation. Okay. So Socrates isn't claiming he's physically invincible. He's just saying that the Athenians will hurt themselves more than him if they kill him. And in that context, he also says that he plays an important social function. Um, uh, they will miss him when he's gone. All right. Uh, the unexamined life is not for a human being. The... It, well, there's a lot of a lot of meaning that you can put into this, um, and I've got an exercise about it. One thing you have to do is think about what it means by examination, um, and for Socrates, this is going to be the kind of thing that he's think doing, where he asks these sort of difficult, deep philosophical questions. Um, these are questions that the other animals can't ask, right? Pigs don't want, wander around wondering what virtue is, at least as far as we know. And um, so at least part of Socrates' argument here is that we've got a unique ability to wonder at the universe. And that means that if we are to be human, we have to use that ability. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that you should just worry about every little thing in your life. In fact, sort of the reverse. Um, he's not interested in worrying about, well, casual things like whether he's eaten or slept recently, right? Um, he's interested in um, the phil in philosophy, right? Philosophy is a, uh, I said at the beginning of this course that philosophy is a natural human activity. And I stand by that. 
What Socrates is saying is that it's also a uniquely human activity. Uh, maybe when we start talking to dolphins, we'll figure out if that's true. But in the meantime, it certainly looks that way. And so if you want to fulfill your human nature, you need to do philosophy. All right. Um, so this video is going to be short, um, but I do want to uh, address one issue with the idea of Socrates that is, is sort of troubling the image of Socrates as a philosopher. It starts with the idea that Socrates compares himself to a gadfly, right? Um, if uh, he says Athens is a, is a noble steed, um, a great, uh, a magnificent horse, um, and you know, horses were high prestige in, in, in Athens at the time, in Greek culture at the time, and um, what is Socrates? Socrates is like a fly that bites a horse on the butt. Um, and the horse is irritated by the fly, but it spurs the horse into action. So one thing that happens that has happened in Western philosophy was, um, with the image of Socrates is now pretty much anyone who acts like a jerk can say they are being Socratic and that they're being a gadfly. So, I mean, here's a question that I would I sometimes ask as a survey. Socrates is rude. This is a big contrast between Socrates and Confucius. Confucius is unfailingly polite. Socrates is abrasive, he is sarcastic, he is mean to the people around him. He mocks them for not knowing, even while he mocks himself for not knowing. Um, and I think this has had, I'm not the only one who thinks this, but uh, certainly a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of people recently in my field in philosophy have been wondering why so many philosophers are such jerks all the time. Um, you know, why they say rude things that, well, and part of it might just be the image of Socrates in our history, right? We all think that to do philosophy means to challenge people, and challenging people is something that you can do, you would do confrontationally, and then you expose them for being frauds who don't really know what they think they know. Um, and this, you can see why this serves a purpose, but at the same time, maybe maybe this isn't really a way to affect social change. I don't know. All right, so um, I'm not doing surveys this year. In the past, I would have surveys on uh, whether you thought Socrates' uh, rudeness was justified and whether you think he's guilty. Um, just, you'll have to think these through on your own. Um, I'm going to uh, end this one here. There's an assignment that I'm, I've labeled an argument finding assignment. And I'm gonna do a quick, just like three minute video explaining what I want you to do for that. Um, and that's part of the Crito reading.